so far. Um, my name is Brian. Actually, I'm not, but I'm representing Brian. <laughs> <laughs> because he's the one who could not make it to the show or to the event. Um, as you may, if you follow the news, we have uh, done an announcement just recently uh, to be part of the ecosystem of, of a company called Siena. For people who don't know Siena, Siena is coming traditionally from the telecom market in the uh, uh, optical networking space as well as the, uh, in the uh, data communication space. And uh, <coughs> has a very large footprint in, uh, uh, in the worldwide deployment, um, connecting multiple data centers to data, data centers. Quick summary on what Blue Orbit means. Blue Orbit is a subsidiary of, uh, of Siena. Uh, Siena is um, focusing on the NFVN SCN deployment. Uh, most of the customers are already using Siena equipment in the network. By moving the, uh, uh, doing the network transformation, uh, Siena has created a, uh, an ecosystem around that for deployment for NFVN and SCN. Uh, initially started in 2013. Uh, it was a, uh, a baseline of the ecosystem to actually look at some of the key elements for network elements to be migrating from a traditional standard um, proprietary platform into a, um, uh, into a sort of an open common architecture. And then basically what, uh, what you were looking at, you're looking at the existing customer base and what's the priority and what's the transition from, from a traditional legacy business into a new uh, virtualized environment. Um, so, based on that, they created uh, a framework for for um, for tool chains for uh, software elements which can be integrated easily into the overall uh, blue planet ecosystem. Uh, today, uh, blue blue orbit ecosystem represents about 97 members. Um, we we've been announced uh, about two months ago to be part of the blue orbit. Uh, ecosystem, you can see that um, we are part of a community partner. Um, within the Blue, Eco, uh, uh, Blue, Blue Orbit ecosystem, there are other partners we are working with today, especially ISVs, which are usually providing the DNF um, uh, on top of our hardware. So um, uh, we, we see some of the network security applications, we, need, we see some of the uh, uh, players in some of the orchestration side for the VNFs and so on. Um, worldwide, uh, there is uh, a representation of the blue ecosystems uh, in multiple continents. What that means is usually they have a representation for a lab, for proof of concepts, for uh, trials and demos, uh, where we will be invited to participate at a level to show service providers to go into, into a uh, uh, sort of a roll-up. If I may ask, you know, how many service providers are in the room? Any other service providers? I guess not. No. All right. So ultimately, our, our aim is towards service providers. The business model is shifting. Traditionally, we're shipping, we are an ODM partner. We're providing hardware for customers who are labeling it uh, based on the customer name. Uh, what's happening now in the industry is that they're sourcing the hardware separately from the software, uh, and we need to be part of this ecosystem, and that's why we're actually facilitating this proof of concept. And so we, Blue Orbit has uh, 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 facilities and lab capabilities in multiple regions um, uh, to actually get a proof of concept going. Um, so, what we've been looking at uh, as a company, what's very interesting to follow is the, uh, the initiative like CORD. CORD stands for Central Office uh, Redesign for a Data Center, which is a new asset initiative to use standard hardware um, for Central Office Appliance uh, applications. Um, also, the Open Networking Operating System, it's another initiative it's for open source. Um, so we are focusing on some of the implementations by using our hardware in combination with the software. And um, 
uh, with the uh, Blue Orbit ecosystem, we're actually having an additional sales channel. That means where sales team from Siena and Blue Orbit <coughs> were positioning Lana at the network operating centers or network operators to use our hardware platforms as a pre-qualified system uh, for the point. We, um, the way we actually been working with Siena, and we have shifted a couple of units to them already, and even <coughs> working on the implementation is, uh, the way they see themselves as, a, as an open, uh, open platform, meaning you are not tied into a specific VNF. Um, traditionally, when you deal with a company like Siena or Juniper, uh, they force you to basically just run one application, and that's a Juniper application on top of that. The way, um, the way uh, it's been created by, um, by the Blue Orbit or uh, orchestration is that it's actually uh, an open platform to have multiple VNFs um, running under the same framework. framework. So meaning that um, um, the, uh, the hardware, the underlying hardware is platforms like the NCA 4010. Um, we also have a, ship, uh, uh, a couple of other platforms for the implementation. Um, what the migration path is, it's that they are actually using their proprietary switching fabric, which is an FPGA base today, and moving it to an x86 architecture. And in that case, they actually will be um, rolling out that on, on uh, standard commercial official hardware. Uh, what you see here is um, uh, the, um, uh, the distributed F, uh, NFVI software layer is a proprietary platform. So it's not based on OpenStack. Usually, typically, the, uh, the deployments today is of uh, uh, OpenStack-based uh, implementations <coughs> like uh, Red Hat, Windriver, and so on. Uh, in this case, uh, Sienna already has legacy deployments uh, for many, many years. They're using the same framework to integrate some of the orchestration layer into this platform. Um, and then the uh, third party application could be from any of the other uh, ecosystem parties. We, we're trying to use one of the, uh, uh, um, one of the open source uh, VNFs to actually showcase that. But ultimately, that VNF could be any of these applications running within the uh, um, Blue Planet uh, ecosystem uh, software. Framework. So, uh, if there are specific questions regarding the, uh, the software implementation, so Brian give us his contacts. We can reach out to them. Um, we can give you an update on what we've been doing so far, what's the status on the implementation. Uh, the latest status for me now is that they are looking into some of the interoperability issues, and we can address that later on. Um, but ultimately, if there is an opportunity with a service provider which are already using Sienna in the network, uh, we would like to hear about it because that could be an opener for us to actually work on a proof of concept in the combination with uh, Sienna, Blue Planet, and, uh, and the ecosystem. <laughs>
So <coughs> from a, you can see from the left to the right, we are just doing some of the access network um, around which of CPS and SD1 are deployments. The aggregation layer. The aggregation layer can contain some of the uh, mobile edge computing platforms. Mobile edge computing, if you put your mind around it, just think about it, a, a little data center in the edge. That's ultimately what it is. So the requirements here are really for a condensed platform with a lot of IO. Um, so it's not a, a data center like uh, which is running HP or Dell servers. Usually you have limited um, availability for space. You have limited availability for power. And you have certain requirements for NEP certifications as well. So that's really on the aggregation layer. And then we have, uh, on the right side, we have the, uh, the core network platforms, which are usually the, um, the application, so the, the, the workhorse for the application in the cloud. This could be a data center or it could be a telco cloud environment. Um, so a, uh, since the trend is moving towards a, uh, a data center environment, you still need to have a characteristics from a central office point of view in terms of high availability, in terms of redundancy, and all the alarm reporting and feature set what you know from the telecom environment. A couple of platforms below that, we can go in more details afterwards. But ultimately, um, we've been kicking off a project in the US uh, and we've been discussing that for, with a customer for quite a while right now. Um, and what we discovered when you want to roll out virtual CPEs, it works very well in the labs. The lab environment is in controlled environment. Everybody can access it. It's easy to reconfigure it. Uh, so it's very simple. So it worked in the lab. So now the next step is to actually do a field trial. So in the field trial, the first call we had with the customer is actually realizing when some of the field engineering folks, the first question I'm hearing uh, on the call is, well, did anybody did a field, field survey? So a field survey meaning what kind of power do we have available? What kind of networking connectivity do we have av available? Do we have access to the site? All these questions are open air questions. So when you ship virtual CPEs, you never know what the environment will be. It could be a filthy uh, shelf somewhere where nobody pays attention to it and you need to deploy uh, a network device. Or it could be a, a lean, a, a clean deployment in a rock environment where you have a system administrator who can really manage the platform. So rolling out virtual CPEs in the field for in the reality, it's really a big question mark. So we need to have solutions and platforms which can actually sustain the deployment model on that. And uh, same thing when you when you roll out virtual CPEs on the customer premise side and you're running multiple applications on the same hardware platform, how do you guarantee the quality of service for each application of virtual for virtual VNF? Uh, on the same hardware platform. So that's coming down on how do I pr prioritize my application one over the other. Um, and uh, so what we want to look at is really the, uh, the, the, um, the edge side. So virtual CPEs, including some of the uh, VNF uh, NFBI appliances. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the VNF uh, the, uh, the NFBI appliance could be a mobile edge computing device, which is usually lo located somewhere at the edge, centralized as a data, data center function. The virtual CPE is really what's going into the customer premises. And the intent is to ship the device, which uh, is deployed by somebody who has no networking expertise, who has no telecom expertise, who's only been tasked to plug it in and then actually get it running. So that has been called zero touch provisioning. And in order to do that, you need to have a couple of framework uh, Im implemented into the device in order to actually roll it out as a call it zero touch <coughs> provisioning. So uh, when you look at the multiple scenarios, in, and uh, in here I did a very good uh, overview on the different modes on the deployment. So we have a centralized mode, distributed mode, and hybrid mode. Um, most of the time when we look at the hybrid mode, the hybrid mode meaning most of the processing, the heavy duty processing is done in the cloud or at the mobile edge computing side. Uh, and you only have a small scale device on the edge. 
which is actually collecting all the data, which is actually running the application for the end user, um, and can be provisioned dynamically. So I can change the application any time at any given, at any time at, 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 um, uh, um, at any uh, circumstances. So uh, that means that we have, we need to have a full connectivity constantly to the device uh, in order to get full visibility. The distributed mode is where we have really multiple, uh, multiple <coughs> VNF devices at the customer premises which are sharing the load workload. It's also called service chaining, where you have multiple applications, multiple applications shared from multiple of these smaller devices. So let's say we have in the same building you have uh, five devices. You can have uh, each device being a different application. It could be a firewall, it could be a could be a security router, or could be anything else. So you basically share all the workloads to the towards the edge. That's the uh, that's pretty much the distributed mode. And when the centralized mode is really when you do um, um, all the um, all the uh, um, uh, all the processing power is purely in the data center, and you only have one function per virtual P virtual VNN. That means you don't need a, a high performance CPU. You only need a small scale, low cost, low power uh, device. Right? Um, and then so. What's the different models for the deployment? And then now once you go to the deployment, the next challenge will come up and you know, how do I manage these devices? Now let's say we have 5,000 sites or 10,000 sites and we're shipping over 10,000 units. And we have a guy on the other hand who's receiving the platform, who's not a, technic a technical guy and supposed to plug it in and supposed to work, right? And let's say something is failing, what's gonna happen? The guy plugs it back up and he ships it back. So it's an operational nightmare. So you don't know, if you don't have visibility from a network operations point of view to a device, um, the business model of rolling out virtual CPEs might not be as economical as it's supposed to be intended, right? In that case, you actually need to have a framework to, do, to manage all these devices. So let's say you have 50,000 sites all over the United States, and you need to manage all of them, you need to have a framework to actually uh, um, accommodate that. And then each device has multiple cores, that means we can actually have up to 16 virtual machines or virtual uh, VNFs running on a, <coughs> on a device at the customer side. So as soon as you lose visibility to, to the device, nothing will work. So we'll have to really just, you know, have a physical person to go there, disconnect it, change the platform. So it's really challenging to come up to that. So the demo we have downstairs of Veneer, it's one framework to show how we can manage multiple VNFs in the virtual CPE deployment by using uh, a device management framework. And what it does is basically connecting to the cloud and it's really giving me the status of the devices. So once I ship it to the, to the customer premise and as soon as I get that connectivity, I can tell what is the status, what is the utilization on each virtual CPU um, and what is my memory bandwidth? So it gives me all the information on the platform remotely as if I would be there in person. That's a process. However, in some cases, we don't have any network connectivity at all. Who knows? So about 50,000 sites, and there's a slight chance that, you know, one of the 10 sites will not, or one of the 50,000 sites, or 10 of the 50,000 sites have no connectivity, or not even temporarily network connectivity. Therefore, uh, the uh, implementation of LTE and Wi-Fi is a key advantage for these kind of devices. So the LTE side will give you a backdoor in the case of. So if you don't have any network connectivity, at least you can manage your platform. You have a lower speed connectivity, but at least you can allocate um, and you can troubleshoot the device yourself, and you can do firmware upgrades remotely. In some cases, we have customers who are telling us we want to run it completely without local area network. We want to run it over LTE. There could be another scenario. In the case where it's a rural area where no fiber is laid in the ground. Right? Um, <coughs> but again, the, the key element to actually com communicate to the cloud and to get all the resources allocated is the device management plane. That's a key element. Otherwise, the whole business model of virtual CPE 
it's not going to be working out very well. Um, and we're ending up in, a, in an operational nightmare. Um, and uh, so that, that allows us to, um, to run off, uh, to deploy some of them. The other element of deploying virtual CPEs is now we have uh, an enterprise which is running, let's say, four to eight different applications on this, the physical device. So who, number one is who's I going to call? Right? I'm having a firewall from a company called, let's say, Checkpoint, and I have a virtual firewall. And I, ha I have another virtual application from another company, company y, XYZ. Um, so who do I call? Who's my interface when, I'm, when things are not going right? Ultimately, it's a service provider, like an AT&T or Verizon. But what we need to do is, we need to actually make sure that we can bring the services equally to the virtual machine and the platform. So if you over-provision, let's say, some of the applications for, um, for, um, for network security, you will end up that um, one application takes more resources than the other, and when you actually not have the guarantee of quality of service on the network utilization, because there's only so much network available. If you have 16 virtual uh, machines running or virtual VNS running, your networking may be becoming a bottleneck at one point. So you need to really make sure that you can actually allocate your, your resources accordingly. MPLS is a, is a key element for that. So MPLS for uh, multi-protocol label switching is giving you the priority path for the networking routes uh, in the deployment. So at least you can actually manage the platform according to what's the biggest priority. But companies don't realize when they try to move towards a uh, virtual CPE deployment is that you still need to be able to manage the network connectivity. If you don't have a method or mechanism to troubleshoot your network bandwidth, how you want to uh, roll out your services. Sometimes, as I said, you only have one meg, sometimes you only have 100 meg available for the networking. And again, if you have multiple 4 to 16 VNFs running, um, you, you know, your network might be just blocking some of the VNFs because of that. So the uh, MPLS Implementation is important for that, um, and the uh, prioritization and queuing from over multiple paths. That's really the element what uh, what's what's the key driver on looking at platforms which can sustain that. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's one of the reason uh, we are very well positioned for the virtual CP market because we are addressing multiple points on that. Um, with the majority of our platforms supporting LT and Wi-Fi, it's uh, the back door, the, the back path to manage the platform is, available, is, is given. So we have the option to actually manage it. The second part is that we're actually supporting 10 gig. Uh, we're supporting uh, open vSwitch on the platform. We can proprietize, we can proprietize the, um, um, the networking path for MPLS. Um, and we have a, a scalable approach to bring in some of the security functions into the same platform. So that's, that's a key element that helps uh, rolling out the um, virtual CP. And then in, a, uh, in addition to that, obviously the ecosystem, right? So we are providing virtual CPEs, but ultimately the virtual CPE will be managed by a third party orchestration layer. And this could be an INEA platform, it could be a Blue Planet platform, it could be um, a Windjammer platform, or you know, all the orchestration, all the companies have their own orchestration layers. Um, but ultimately, we need to work with them seamlessly in order to make a, a smooth deployment. Um, so that's pretty much a summary on uh, what we have seen so far on the Witches B deployment. deep dive on the, uh, on the aggregation on the core side on the network. So um, you can see some of the acronyms. Um, so we, uh, 
networking appliance and firewall appliance for which CP, we already covered that. Now we're looking a little bit more on the uh, higher end platforms. Um, and um, they've been called HTCA uh, platforms. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you in a second why this is the case. Um, ultimately, what the uh, strategy is on the platform is to commoditize hardware resources. So what you will see is you will have two different, you have different layers on platforms, which are modular and which are interchangeable. So in other words, we can use the same hardware platform on a bladed architecture on the low end and reuse it on the high end platform as well. Plus we're integrating switching and storage in the same footprint. So that makes it um, platform. HTCA is standing for Hybrid Telecommunications Computing Architecture, which is a variant to the initial standard from uh, Advanced Telecommunications Computing Architecture. Ultimately, what I tell customers is that it's ultimately the same, except uh, proprietary under the LANA standard. And uh, it uses the uh, best components for management, network connectivity, and storage in a small footprint with a high density. So most of the time when people ask me as well, why don't we use HP or Dell in the data center? Well, because you can't deploy these platforms in the mobile edge computing side. Mobile edge computing side is very dense. It's very, uh, very, um, very small footprint. So you cannot have a, do a large server from HP or Dell deployed in that environment. Plus they don't meet the of the networking specification for network equipment building specification. So that's why these platforms are remaining to be needed in the, in the network. Um, and as you can see, we, we scale from a low end all the way end to a high end. So scalable um, because if you just think about that which CP rollout is just starting, imagine about in five years. You need a lot of I.O. capabilities and a lot of processing at the edge. And this is what it's been intended for. So the concept of the hybrid telecommunications architecture is we need to aggregate multiple uh, CPU resources into a single platform. And this could be done by interconnecting with through switching, but also to provide direct access for network connectivity to each individual CPU core and therefore for each individual virtual machine. Um, <clears throat> with the technology available now going within the internal backplane connectivity up to 100 gig, we actually have a, 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 a platform which can actually scale all the way up to, uh, to 10, 25, 40, and 100 gig in the, in the backplane. So that's fairly new. Um, and this will uh, give more uh, confidence in the rollout by using commodity x86 platforms to deploy with them. So um, you can see that we're keeping the telecoms uh, uh, feature set in the platform for redundancy. So we have two switches per platform. That means we have a high availability feature set. High availability meaning at least five, five nines redundancy. In case uh, switching fabric fails, we still maintain the CPU workload. We still can manage it. We still have traffic. And the same thing on the uh, on the CPU side. So we we will not lose any CPU nodes on the platform. Um, and then we have uh, uh, direct access as well to each individual node. Some of the uh, use cases for that. Um, since Intel is rolling out <coughs> the next generation CPUs with uh, multiple cores uh, beyond uh, 28 cores eventually, um, there are some of the applications where we can really run multiple VNFs on the same hardware platform. Um, we can uh, we, we see some of the transition from a traditional proprietary based um, platform into a uh, standard x86 based platform for uh, broadband remote access, mobile edge computing, 
as I mentioned earlier, is considered to be the many data center in the, at the edge, which needs all uh, a lot of resources just to be more efficient in the network processing or in the processing side. Um, cloud ra radio access network, uh, content delivery networks is one uh, important portion of it for video. We saw a little bit on uh, the Intel presentation where video is becoming the biggest uh, consumer of a networking bandwidth and demand. So um, in that case, we actually need also the compute resources available in the network. And then the uh, virtual EPC, um, which is also moving into a commodity hardware aspect as well. So quick snapshot on what the platform platforms are looking like. So again, the idea is to have a common baseline on the hardware platform, meaning in this case it's modular. Uh, you can see the back of the platform. Each on this stop is representing a CPU blade. Each CPU blade can be up to 28 cores um, and uh, per socket. So meaning you have a high dense compute platform, uh, scalable, um, with interconnectivity of um, uh, up to 100 gig within the platform. We have a management layer built in. So there is a uh, platform management functionality using IPMI, which is managing all the field replaceable units. Um, so the system management portion is independent from the Resource management. Resource management is typically OpenStack based. System management is usually based on IPMI, uh, giving you the, uh, um, the, the ability to manage each individual component in the platform. And uh, you can see on the left, we have centralized storage built into it as, at the same time. And then you can have redundant switches, but also direct access to each and every CPU. So you can imagine if you if you deploy this at the edge and you have, let's say, at a batch of, let's say, 500 virtual CPEs, if you're stacking that up and you have direct connectivity to the virtual CPEs, um, that's applications where we actually can use this platform more efficient. Because if you look at an HP or Dell, you have limited network connectivity. You don't have the amount of gigi and 10 gigi ports on a single platform. So that platform is a real good use case for mobile edge computing where you, where you manage multiple virtual CPU devices uh, connected to a, to a core or to an edge, a mobile edge computing platform. So that's the uh, larger platform, a bit of a uh, internal connectivity so you can see, um, since it's a modular platform, you, we have different configuration options. Um, we can have internal switches. What it does is going to be eliminate the top of rack switch. So we have a we have it fully integrated, but you don't need to have it. That means we can actually also use direct access to the um, uh, to the PCI Express uh, like lanes, meaning we have NIC cards. But we can have direct access for one 10 gig um, to the mid plane to the CPU. So in that case, we can have direct connectivity. So we don't aggregate the networking through a switch. We actually use everything directly to each and every CPU. Plane. We put the um, Winterval Titanium Server implementation on the slide because we have done some work already with Winterval Titanium for their orchestration layer. So if you can imagine that each CPU represents 28, C, uh, each, each socket represents 28 CPUs, um, and we have six blades, um, you have no other way of using the uh, resources by using um, an orchestration like Vindrava. Otherwise, it will be inefficient. That's the only way of managing it. And yeah, so this is giving you a, a bit of an idea on the, uh, on the architecture. The second one is the scaled down version. Again, the uh, CPU blades remaining the same. They are fully exchangeable with the larger one, larger platforms. Um, the only difference here in this platform is we have, um, you know, we have uh, 
um, addition, we have uh, storage capabilities built in, um, but we have a um, we have a um, a lower cost and lower entrance point platform in that in that sense. And ultimately, what has happened here is we took some of the ideas from the Intel open networking platform and we migrate them. We combine switching and computing into one single platform. Um, and uh, the other thing to keep in mind on this platform is even though we're using um, x86 platforms today, so similar, this is the same um, architecture than before, except we scaled down in terms of the number of slots. Um, what's also interesting is that we have customers who are looking into migrating their proprietary based platform into a form factor which is based on our form factor in order to populate it into the same platform. So ultimately, they don't need to worry about building a chassis. The chassis exists. We can have, a, we, we can purpose build a specific blade for them to plug into the same platform and take full advantage on the ecosystem. So that's the second layer on the, on the storage side. Um, so, so this is yeah. So this is storage <coughs> implementation. Same thing. Um, we're using the same elements for switching <coughs> and for compute. Only difference here is we have higher storage capability for some of the centralized storage. So we can run Ceph, for example, an open source management layer for um, for storage. Um, and uh, this is for some of the application where we're really using some of the centralized storage applications for, let's say, home location registers or uh, home subscriber servers, where database applications are very intense. Um, similar concept um, from a compute perspective, except that we're actually using most of the PCI Express lanes for storage. Um, and then we'll go into the lower NMSC entrance point. So that's, that's, where, that's the first platform that we have available for customers benchmarking and testing. And uh, so the interesting part is here is that we, again, same concept, we, we, we're keeping the same form factor for the, for the CPU blades. Um, the interesting portion is that we already have uh, the latest Intel CPUs available for testing. That means we can actually uh, do benchmarking and testing for um, 40 gig inter internally for KR connectivity. We can also um, uh, uh, validate the, uh, the switching capabilities. Um, and uh, same thing for management. On the management side, we also have um, a system manager framework built in, which is based on for SNMP to actually do remote management on the hardware platform. So, um, um, and then on the switching side, we're using Broadcom at the moment. We are evaluating other switch vendors to see what would be the best performance on that. So we're looking at an alternative for some of the media platforms to have a, a different performance on the switching side. <coughs> but ultimately, since it's a modular approach, we can actually have also other switching fabrics built into the same platform. Ultimately, the same hardware platform, the baseline uh, remains, but we can have a, a, a customized version for customer requirements. And um, ultimately, we also have been done, work, done some work on the ecosystem, including in here, where we did some uh, benchmarking on that. Uh, including Vindrava, uh, it has been working on the titanium platform as well, um, which is available today. Um, and we will be extending that ecosystem to actually roll out much quicker in the network. So that's pretty much it. So Albert is, Albert Pang is the one who manages the product line and he was the one who's contributing to the content. And he is also the contact point for us to get future requirements into the pipeline if there are some specific requirements you need.
talking about the uh, SDN and NLV uh, in five years ago, uh, that uh, my first time uh, uh, reading uh, some documents uh, on this. Uh, at that time, not too much on the NLV, but the main focus on SDN because uh, Google are uh, starting uh, to share the support deployment in their new uh, data center in uh, April of uh, 2012. And at the time I do, uh, uh, at the time I was uh, working in Arthur Lucent, and I do have uh, some uh, sharing with uh, various uh, uh, sales uh, representatives in different continentals, uh, including uh, enterprise and, and also uh, carrier focus. And at that time I fear STN, well, Google announced it, but uh, we, we, we didn't hear many uh, customers talking about this. But however, until uh, uh, two years ago, uh, when I uh, was invited to join uh, then, we, we do uh, another uh, investigation, which prior to that, uh, I have been uh, serving uh, for uh, this team that lecture course uh, for IEEE uh, during uh, uh, 2014 and 2015 uh, to share some of the uh, successful POC cases uh, in North America and particularly uh, uh, for some example like uh, the DDoS uh, prevention from the network side uh, which have been uh, uh, implemented uh, today uh, in at and services to keep the, their clients uh, network being protected uh, for the DDoS uh, attack. So uh, for that sharing, I then uh, seriously rethink the importance and the flexibility of software defined network. And that time, I also uh, uh, getting aware of uh, some uh, development, uh, not only in the Open Network Foundation, uh, which uh, defined the industrial uh, uh, SDN uh, protocol for open flow, but also uh, uh, from the connection with uh, ONF, uh, I also explored uh, some uh, opportunity in the naval function generation field and, and they have uh, uh, some uh, practical uh, discussion uh, with uh, various uh, service provider including uh, NTT uh, and also uh, at and and Orange uh, but mainly in uh, North America at that time and a few in Japan but not too many uh, then uh, we have uh, worked together to uh, build uh, some uh, POC. Uh, at that time, SD work is not that hard. But we start to build it uh, uh, for different uh, class of services, uh, bandwidth aggregation, as well as a zero touch uh, provision. And then sooner or later, starting from uh, beginning of uh, 2015, uh, when we roll out our uh, vision and the focus of uh, telecom application business with inside Lender, uh, then the market uh, uh, start to blow out and uh, we have uh, received uh, several, uh, I think, uh, dramatically uh, growing uh, inquiry of uh, invitation, uh, not only from the service provider, but also from uh, independent uh, survey vendors, uh, they are doing, uh, uh, they are either a startup or a, a spin off uh, from a large corporation, including a company like uh, New Arch Networks. And then uh, the trend just moved up, and uh, after several uh, successful field trials, uh, right now I believe uh, toward uh, 2020, which was originally indicated by ATT that they want to transform 75% of their internal infrastructure to a, a cloud-based uh, uh, platforms. So right now, uh, it's really hard and uh, every month, uh, we receive a new inquiry from uh, North America. And we also do some uh, uh, quite good uh, deployment uh, with, uh, with uh, top tier of service provider in Canada, in the uh, uh, United States. And also, uh, 
Two months ago, uh, Spain has been working with uh, one of the largest system integrators uh, to uh, approach uh, another opportunity in uh, South America, Brazil. And uh, it also went well. So uh, in North America, it's very hard now. And starting uh, from that, uh, the uh, South America also uh, warmed up. And in Asia Pacific, we know that uh, uh, in Joey's territory, uh, Telstra, and we also have uh, some uh, successful try in uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, more or less uh, we have uh, worked with uh, uh, dealing the international for some uh, POC opportunity in Singapore, and then recently uh, we also been uh, selected uh, by Orange for the uh, open uh, virtual platform uh, uh, project. Uh, that uh, already uh, start the uh, lab in-house uh, lab try, and uh, more or less uh, uh, in uh, Japan we also uh, work uh, very close uh, with NTT lab, and, and uh, they work uh, out some uh, uh, data center solution for the NTT communication. Uh, besides this, also we have uh, some uh, good uh, earlier try in uh, Korea. Uh, in uh, SK, Network, SKT, and also uh, some uh, coming opportunity. So I think the market uh, is now uh, become harder, and uh, I saw also saw uh, in uh, is uh, is laughing because uh, he also get a uh, push from a uh, uh, few ISV uh, to uh, conduct a uh, uh, remote trial on the SDC platform. So uh, the market is is really good, and we special thanks to. Uh, uh, some audience uh, from uh, DNI, from Alpha Networks, uh, that we have uh, some ongoing uh, uh, testing or validation or opportunity sharing. So we look forward to work with you together. And uh, special thanks uh, to uh, Inia, uh, Mr. Ming, yeah, uh, who have uh, specific come to Taipei uh, to share uh, their successful story and also to share the experience with us. So, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, thank you uh, for uh, spending a uh, few hours uh, with us, uh, and uh, we will take this as the first step uh, toward the next uh, success of the uh, network transformation.